This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Yeah, evening everyone. We are here today joined by Ariel and Talir to cover one of the most anticipated chapters in the book, if not the series. <laughs> yeah, why don't you two like introduce yourselves in case people um, have, you've both been on the podcast before, but. Uh, I'm Ariel Burgess. I was an officially Wheel of Time licensed artist for eight years. And yeah, I worked on the series a bunch, loved the series before that, still like it, uh, despite whatever the show does. And um, yeah, looking forward to talking about one of my favorite chapters. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Talir. I am probably most known about, about these circles for helping out with spoiler con stuff, but I've been around the podcast uh, for quite a while and I've been reading the Wheel of Time since I was 14. Uh, which is in the 90s and uh yeah this is also one of my favorite chapters and a nice coda to the last time i was on the podcast which was discuss gowan and uh Egwene in uh like lightning and rain so i really wanted to kind of have a couple bookends of uh, romantic chapters to <laughs> yeah well thank you both for coming and of course being flexible with the scheduling obviously this chapter is being recorded out of order because jordan khan was a massive ripple in all of everyone's planning but i'm really glad to have you both here and to you know have seth be kicked out for once not for once it happens occasionally <laughs> we are here to talk about mashiara and also some other stuff because like technically this chapter includes more than one of the most iconic scenes ever there's actually a, an excellent uh kin slap down at the end <laughs> but you know who talks about that really that's not the important part i always forget about that i've reread this chapter again and again and again and every time i read it i'm like oh what's this without the kin um because i just i'm really there for the nine even land content and then uh but the kin scene really is excellent so it's sort of the chapter is even better for the fact that it has these two totally different uh, sets of scenes in it. But I always forget that because that's never why I go back to reread it. For sure. And it's not included in the title at all. I mean, Mashiara is all about the first scene. But yeah, the kin scene is, um, it's a banger. <laughs> it's uh, and I think it's not just a banger, like it's a world changer, you know, where, where they go from there is, I would love to see in a couple hundred years where the Ace and I go from there because of the whole kin scene. Yeah, I, I'd forgotten it was in there too. Uh, I was getting through it. I was like, oh yeah, the rest of this chapter isn't just them. Oh yeah, it skips the wedding. Ah. It's also such a tightly written chapter. I mean, I think this is some, you know, Crown of Swords for me is really the last book that's very kind of tightly written where every scene really feels like it's moving either character or story forward you know and we're about to kind of get into some of the slog uh books but i think that's this chapter really illustrates that for me of that you can have these kind of two iconic scenes one the reunion of Nynaeve and Lan and two where the kin find out that the Aes Sedai have known about them all the time and that they're going to be welcomed back into some aspect of tower community those are two huge scenes and they fit into this one chapter and move the story along in a way that I got frustrated with some of the later books because it took, it seemed many scenes to move in as the plot along as much as that. Yeah, yeah. totally nodding. <laughs> it's a very, very dense chapter as far as plot compared to some of the later volumes. <laughs> it feels like uh, it actually, like you're saying, like it's, it's well put together and like stuff is actually happening and it's not dragging out. And that's part of why I think it's one of the best chapters because it just gets to the point and there's communication. Yeah. yeah. Like there's so many chapters where there's no communication and there still could be better communication, but uh, the way that Nynaeve and Lan are, or Lan are, is very um, 80s romancy where, you know, the woman slaps and he's very stoic and doesn't show his emotions and like there's actually some like verbal and physical abuse that goes on but it seemed like romantic but yeah it it besides that like it it's a very like oh finally people are talking to each other and moving stuff along and then we get to the next few books where it's like nobody talks to anybody and let's not forget also it moves character along because Nynaeve breaks her block in this chapter. Yes. Which is yeah. such a huge character moment for her and the fact that that happens all in this one chapter is is sort of crazy. 
from before I knew that they were going to end up together, I have loved these two characters. And so the fact that I get, we, they finally are reunited when they haven't been together since book four. And here they are in book seven. And I just, I love that Nynaeve is like, we're getting married right now. Yeah. <laughs> My own marriage was sort of like that. Uh, so it was sort of very interesting in a like, no, no, it was COVID driven, right? But we need to get married right now. Um, so I think I took that a little bit from Nynaeve. Like, no, 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 this is a good idea. Like, let's just, just take care of this. I'm not letting you get away. Yeah. Yeah. I almost find it a little disappointing that she breaks her block in the same chapter as she resolves with Lan. It's almost like these are such huge moments. They really could have been separated. Yeah. But yeah. Sometimes life is like that it's just kind of all at once and it's because of a thing and um you know she didn't break it because of lan she broke it because her life was in danger and she had to almost die i mean she she had to almost pass out she would have drowned if she died but she had to almost pass out and like actually give in and i've always loved nynaeve and lan is definitely one of my favorite characters Egwene is probably my most favorite but as I get older, I I relate more and more to Nynaeve and especially this scene because it really like it brings up the like the amount of anxiety and stress that she's carrying all the time. And that's why she's created this block is, um, you know, to protect herself through all of that stress. And when you finally relax and you finally let go because you you don't know how to let go, she she finally does break through that and. I just and I love that it kept going and she didn't even realize that she had broken it. Yeah, that part's fun. <laughs> she's like, oh wait, what? <laughs> and she embraces death, you know, in that essence, she's very like Lan yeah. in the moment. And yet it is not about Lan, right? It's about Nynaeve's character growth. And I Ariel, I think that's such an important point. In a worse story by a poorer storyteller, she would have broken her block because of her relationship. Right. It would have been her, her um, significant other was in danger and she had to break her block to save him or, you know, even more tropey reverse the genders. Right. Yeah. Um, but the fact that it, she does not know Lan is there, <laughs> she does not know that, you know, Lan is going to help save her. Um, she breaks her block without him, I think is such an important part of her development um, as a character and as an independent character who we can appreciate separate from her relationship. Yeah, for sure. That that would make it frustrating if she broke the block because of him. He just happens to be there and it's like, okay, so that was concise story storytelling. Doesn't really diminish her accomplishment at like overcoming this huge thing. And it's such a relief to have both those things, to have the unrequited love resolved and to have the I have to be ragingly pissed to channel thing. Like to have those both in the past is it's a relief. <laughs> yeah, I, I also have was like the just very jealous of her ability to just dry herself off immediately and then wipe away the vomit <laughs> <You know? laughs> so i i wanted to ask about that and i realize we're going out of order in the chapter um so we could come back to it when nynaeve is doing that sudden drying herself uh, spell is that the same weave that rand uses with avienda in the last book not sure i mean why not yeah like it's a towel weave right like it's just like but I guess because Rand isn't trying to remove water from clothing in that last scene because they're like they just took a shower so they're naked plus he's working with LTT knowledge so it's probably more finessey but <laughs> I'm wondering if that is an example of Nynaeve recreating an Age of Legends weave without even realizing it. it's not giving any attention or if that's something that she's learned along the way because either it's another example, not highlighted at all, of Nynaeve doing something that is, you know, very epic, um, almost without thought, or what Rand does later is actually not as big a deal as, you know, he makes it out to be. You know, he's like, look at what I can do, you know, um, and it's sort of like, actually, all the Aes Sedai know how to do that, and they taught Nynaeve when she was an accepted. I don't, I, I may be forgetting a lot, but I don't recall Aes Sedai drying themselves off like that. I do. Maybe. When when she's yeah. with Theodron and like the water gets dumped over her, I'm pretty sure that um, there's a weave used to dry. Because remember, Theodron says like dry your hair naturally. Right. So, so maybe maybe the the Age of Legends thing is the shower piece of it, and not so much the drying piece. Yeah, of it. I think it's maybe, the whole yeah. like hot, like moving sauna with soap situation, which I would love. That would be amazing. <laughs> 
It's sort of like going through a car wash. Yeah, but without the like heavy brushes. <laughs> it's like, or like an old sprinkler system. So where do we start? Do we want to start with the beginning? A beginning. <laughs> yes, a beginning. I was wondering if um, either of you wanted to, to read us in to the chapter or if I should take the plunge on it. Um, I'll, I'll do it. Chapter 31, Mashiara. As the boat swept away from the landing, Nynaeve tossed her mask down beside her on the cushion bench and slumped back with arms folded and braid gripped firmly, scowling at nothing, scowling at everything. Listening to the wind still told her a fierce storm was on the way, the kind that tore off roofs and flattened barns, and she almost wished the river would begin to kick up in waves right that minute. If it isn't the weather, Nynaeve, she mimicked, then you should be the one to go. The mitrish of the ships might be insulted if we didn't send the strongest of us. They know I said I put great store in that. Bah, that had been Elaine, except for the bah. Elaine just thought putting up with any amount of nonsense for Merrilil would be preferable to facing Nesta again. Once you began badly with someone, it was hard to recover. Matt Cawthon was proof enough of that. And if they had gotten off any worse with Nesta didn't raise two moons, she would be sending the lot of them to fetch and carry. Horrible woman, she grumbled, shifting around on the seat cushions. Avienda had been no better when Nynaeve suggested that she should go to the sea folk. Those people had been fascinated by her. She pitched her voice high and finicky, not at all like Avienda's, but the mood fit. We will learn of this trouble when we learn, Nynaeve Almira. Perhaps I will learn something watching Jaikim Carradin today. If not for the fact that nothing whatsoever frightened the Ayo woman, she would have thought Avienda fearful from her eagerness to spy on Carradin. A day standing in a hot street jostled by crowds was not amusing, and today would be worse with the festival. Nynaeve would have thought the woman would enjoy a nice, refreshing boat ride. <laughs> nice. Also, excellent impressions. <laughs> You can tell that I have uh, young children, that, uh, nephews in this case, that I have often read to. Mm -hmm. Voices are required. It's it's very true. Voices are important. Yeah. I, I do love that Nynaeve is like a nice, refreshing boat ride. Yeah. Okay, Nynaeve. First of all, Nynaeve, who gets seasick all the time, this is going to be a nice, refreshing boat ride. Never mind uh, what ends up happening. And never mind that uh, Avienda is not yield. Right. right. And is I like, know. no, I am scared shitless by all this water. Never again. Right. And this comes in a little bit later in the chapter, but where Nynaeve is starting to notice there's something about Elaine and Avienda and like that they may be working against her. Nynaeve, it's interesting how unobservant she can be at times and how she has not figured out how close Elaine and Avienda are. You know, I, I wrote something about that, how she, she's, she can be really unobservant of like, her surroundings but she picks up on body language and people's like emotions very well and I think she she's really good at like getting to the heart of like what people are feeling and doing and she she points it out without thinking about tact so much and <laughs> that's something that I really like about her and it's a really good balance to like Elaine where Elaine is extremely calculated and she's always playing chess but she's not always picking up on those emotions. She's thinking about, you know, what steps people are taking to backstab so-and-so. And I think it's like, they're actually a really good balance to each other and they get so on each other about it, but it was genius of Egwene to be like, no, you two specifically should go do the thing. That's a good point that they're very different like that. And yeah, Nynaeve, like she picks up on stuff, but she doesn't put it together in the same way. She's like, well, that the explanation that seems logical clearly can't happen. Like there's no way that the obvious thing is, is makes sense in my worldview. So I'm just going to assume it's something else. Like she takes the data and doesn't know what to do with it. Whereas Elaine is really calculating with the data and is like, well, if nothing else makes sense, then there, you know. And to briefly bring up the dress that it goes into describing the one that she's wearing uh, was originally the dress that I was designing for the card game dress. It's that, that it ended up being slightly different. It doesn't have like the gems because they wanted uh, her to be wearing Land's necklace. But um, yeah, that was the dress that I was designing. So it's the clothes are really interesting to me because Nynaeve um, lacks a lot of self-awareness. And one of the ways in which she lacks self-awareness is that she thinks that she hasn't changed at all. In fact, at one point she says, Nesta would have to take her as she was. Nynaeve Almira did not go changing herself for anyone. And that line 
is embedded in her descriptions of the silk dress that she's wearing and all the jewels that she's wearing. There's no line here about how two river woolens are good enough for her. Um, instead, uh, she says, thinking about silks and laces was soothing. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, not just that, but the the hem the neckline and she and this is actually something that I like went over back and forth with um Tavern Tease about uh and Bandersnatch that um you know she constantly mentions how everyone else needs to be modest and then like there's a very brief statement about her neckline's probably a little lower than it should be but it's not mm. immodest right uh and they actually for the card art I had done a very deep neckline and they're like oh nine eight doesn't show that much bosom I was like excuse me but <laughs> point she's like lan look at these like as much as she can and also she's been spending a lot of time in Ibo Dar. right 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 yeah even like her modest at that point is still much more immodest than where she started yeah. right it's, sort of, it's a shame that like Nynaeve never goes back to Eamon's field like could you imagine um I could totally see her like changing back into two rivers woolens just and then complaining about how scratchy they are mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, like, she I can't believe I wore this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think I wrote uh, that was like the third thing that I wrote was about her uh, her denial, you know, and also the the fact that the sea folk find her fascinating. The fact that she doesn't get that, like, of course they would find her fascinating. She has this like weather sense that's even unusual for an Aes Sedai, and I don't even know if that really is part of her. I guess it is part of her her abilities, but it almost seemed like something very Nynaeve specific or like the true power specific to her that she could tell what was coming. Another thing that I, I find throughout this chapter that is really interesting is the way that Jordan peppers in references to other characters and what's going on with them. So just early here in the chapter, there's a couple mentions of Matt mm -hmm. and you know Matt does show up at the end of the chapter, but uh, he she talks about how uh, Matt is, um, you know, proof of how if you start off badly with someone, you can't recover, um, you know, getting in that dig at Matt. And then also about um, Matt and Tylen, that, you know, Tylen gives her this necklace um, as a gift for bringing her Matt. And Nynaeve is totally does not understand the relationship between Matt and Tylen at all. Uh, and then again, with Abby and Elaine, she doesn't understand that. And she just also doesn't understand there's a mention of the bracelet that Rand gave to Avienda, which of course Nynaeve does not know that Rand gave to Avienda. And Abby, and when she asks if she could borrow it, and Avienda clutches it, and then Elaine starts comforting Avienda over it. And Nynaeve is just like, I, I don't know what's going on. But it's almost like she doesn't even want to inquire. Like she kind of notices these things. But as you were saying about how she's not kind of interested so much in the pattern. If Nynaeve just kind of sat down and like wrote out these observations, she might actually think something is going on there, but she doesn't, uh, she's always sort of blindsided by these relationships that other people are having uh, because she's just not putting it together. Well, she puts her, I think it's not so much that she's not putting it together, but she's more blinded by her biases of what she thinks people are and how they are. And then she just like plasters that on them and thinks, well, this is the way they are. So of course they're going to do this thing. And she's thinking, oh, well, they're going to do this, this, and this, and isn't paying attention to what's actually happening in front of her and their actual growth and how their interpersonal relationships are changing. Uh, she's more focused on, well, yeah, it's Rand. He's just, you know, being a mopey, silly teenager and he has no idea what he's talking about instead of like listening. Yeah. I mean, same with Matt, right? Like, Matt hasn't demanded anything unreasonable of them, but like he's definitely going to any minute now. And mm -hmm. it's like, you're still thinking of Matt as the person who sets badgers loose on the green, not someone who's concerned about your physical welfare. Like he's clearly demonstrated he cares about that at this point and he's not abusing these promises you made to him. But like, can you see that? No, no. You I can't. think she does work on that towards the end though. Like she finds a better way of like towards the end of the series of actually paying attention more and listening and and realizing that like hey I've been I've been thinking things too much from my perspective and not not yours. Yeah, for sure. Marriage is good for her emotional maturity like that. <laughs> it's not just marriage, it's also just her experiences have changed her and who she is and in subtle ways as well as larger ways. But there's a mention later in the chapter when uh she finds out about the bail fire, she says about Malgedian but she basically says that she can deal with Mogadian. So she says, Mogadian, 
While she had beaten Maggetti and not once but twice, she could do so a third time if necessary. Which is a far cry, right, from how she used to be. Uh, right. You know, and a self-described coward, right? And obviously, you know, she's told very clearly that she is not a coward. That line shows how Nynaeve has accepted, at least to some extent, that she is not as much of a coward. So there's at least some self-awareness of her own change. Well, and, and that she's not, um, she's not thinking about that she's a wisdom from the two rivers. She's thinking, I can take on a forsaken, a legendary bad guy, one of 13, who is just, you know, the, the stuff of nightmares. Yeah, I can take them on. That I was thinking about that going like, wow, she's, she's feeling confident about her abilities and she's right. Yeah, no, coming to terms with herself is is an important part of her process. I mean, all the characters go through that, but I think we see so much of Nynaeve's struggles with herself. We really get to see her gaining confidence in herself over the series. And in a different way than the other characters, particularly the other female characters, you know, I mean, you see that kind of growth in Elaine and Egwene as well in particular, but they have very different paths. Nynaeve does not achieve a power position in the same way. Yes, she's one a very powerful Aes Sedai, but for most of the series, she's not considered a full Aes Sedai by her peers. And so she doesn't have quite that same level of authority. And even then later in the series, you know, she's really kind of Rand's kind of attache. Uh, whereas Elaine, of course, becomes Queen of Andor and Egwene is Amerlin. So you like they have to deal with more of the politics and that forces them to grow in different ways than than Nynaeve does. I've always related so much to Nynaeve because anger is definitely like the number one emotion I struggle with. So like the politics and conniving of the other two is like that is an interesting thing. But Nynaeve, it's like, oh, relatable. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's picking up on a lot of important things by having her dealings with Elaine because she will be queen of Malkir and the people that are left of that and, and the nation that will grow out of it again uh, and being able to learn those things and how to how to run a nation and how to be strong and steadfast for a people and care about a people but also not wear it so much that it kills her and I think that's part of why she's so angry all the time is that she can't heal everyone she can't fix everything and it's so hard for her to deal with that she can't fix everything even when it's not her responsibility to. Yeah, Nynaeve is a caretaker. She wants to take care of the people that she cares about and that she feels responsible for. And I do think it's interesting that, you know, early on in the series, because she's kind of that older sister sort of character, um, the the other Eamon's fielders kind of see her in a negative light in a lot of ways, right? That mm -hmm. she's preventing them from doing what they want to do. And I, you know, what you were saying just there, Ariel, made me think that she's going to be beloved as a queen. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like that kind of negative emotions towards her that a lot of people also bring to the series. A lot of people don't like Nynaeve at first mm -hmm. um, because she's kind of acerbic and in that way. But if you think about like that growth is going to be, she's going to be totally beloved. I don't know. I wish there was more. I would love to see where like in a couple hundred years, Malkir ends up and where she ends up. And I was thinking about it, reading it, like one day Lan will pass away and she'll live beyond him. Maybe, but she loves him so much that she might not. Would she ever, would she live past him? Would she ever love again? Or would she just be the like, just never ending queen who rules Malkir and everybody would love her because, because of who she is and because of how much she loved Lan and how much she loved what was important to him. Yeah, kind of be queen in her own right in some mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. I, I like to think as, as invested as I have been for a very long time in the Nynaeve Lan relationship, I think, I think Nynaeve would survive Lan's death. You know, I think that, you know, I'm not saying it wouldn't be hard on her, but right. I, there's, you know, I think that regardless of whether, you know, she had children by him mm -hmm. that uh, would need, you know, um, that she, I, I still think we're, even if she doesn't, that she would uh, have plenty to live for. Um, but I'm glad I don't have to read that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, think I don't want to read that. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to read that either. And I think it's not so much that like she, I think it's just like heartbreak of uh, yeah. like how, there are some people that, you know, you read these stories about elderly couples, the one of them goes and a couple months later, the other one goes. It's just like, I think they're, they're that much in love. And I don't get that kind of sense from any of the other relationships in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, Certainly not a going and going. No, no. No. <laughs> no, I do think it's really, it, it made me think, Ariel, like how much I would love to have an anthology of short stories 
about Aes Sedai or channelers and their relationships, right? Because this is a problem, you know, it's a reason why Aes Sedai don't tend to marry. And, but also now that we have Ashaman, like how interesting is that? The idea of people having relationships that last centuries. Um, right, Andrew and Pravara. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think I, that would be so I'm sure there's plenty of fan fiction out there for that. But like, that would be <laughs> yeah, well, should we hit the boat with Balefire? Yeah, yeah, let's hit the boat. So, yeah, she's going along, bitching and moaning about all these other characters. And then suddenly waves of Sidar and the boat is at the bottom of the river before she can even think about it, which Seth and I were arguing about the timing of that, because the Balefire hits the boat. But does it affect water the way it would affect living things like and the timing in the description is like that it sinks out of sight with bubbles coming out of it so it's like the water still needs time to enter the boat because it's not alive hmm. the, the I mean, I, sequence of events seems a little funky yeah i mean it's a bellfire thing right so the bellfire hits unravels it to the point in the past but that time has still happened since and therefore, you know, a minute has passed in real time since that happened. It's just the destruction of the boat happened a minute ago. Mm -hmm. And therefore, water has time to get in. I'm not sure how consistent that is with Bellfire's use in other instances. Right. But um, I, I guess, that, I mean, that's at least the logic here. But going back to the previous chapter, I did find it so fascinating about Mogedian just being like taking that chance of seeing Nynaeve and being like, I'm going to take this opportunity to try to kill her from afar, right? Mangedian, not an honorable character. <laughs> None of this, like, no. fight me, right, face to face. Mangedian's like, and I kind of, that's one reason that I kind of love Mangedian. I'm like, you know, there's none of that honor stuff that's a, that's someone who I want dead. Uh, I'm going to kill them because I have an opportunity to do so. And I'm not sure if you talked about this in the previous chapter, but what caused the pigeons to throw her off base? Taviran. <laughs> But I need to not Taverin. There's no Taver I mean, I guess Matt's there, but like that's not how Matt's Taverinness works. So for those that may not recall this from the previous chapter, Mogedian is trying to send Balefire straight through the passenger cabin so she kills Nynaeve directly. But then a flock of pigeons essentially throws her off, and she that's why it goes through the boat and causes the boat to sink instead of killing her directly. And it's just sort of like, what causes the pigeons? And I mean Taverin is an easier answer, but Nynaeve's not Taverin. Matt's not right there. Rand needs her to cleanse the taint. So uh, I, I just assumed that it was because, you know, they're in a very busy city and there's a lot of pigeons and uh, she's easily startled these days. And yeah, <laughs> that's, there's, there's that. that's kind of where I, I assumed it would be. But yeah, I mean, it might have been. And, and, and then it comes all back to like the, is there a creator? Thing, right. You know? Yeah. Well, to me, it, it spoke of the... Um... He speaks through pigeons. <laughs> the in the first book when Logan is in the cage and Rand is sitting on the wall and Logan goes by in his cage parade and Rand sees Logan laugh and then in book six Logan tells us why he laughed in that moment mm -hmm. I kind of remember being like oh are we gonna find out in six books why those pigeons like who made the pigeons stop Mogedian and no we're not gonna find out it could just be pigeons okay um, pigeons our heroes of the horn. Let's go with that. I just had a thought. I wonder if it was like because so like Mogedian feels the Corsuver getting touched. Yeah. I wonder if like somehow that like gravity well of like evil attention like disturbed the pigeons. Oh. Or, or does something do it directly. Or like yeah. I mean, um, Grandal uses is it a pigeon or a dove to see through their eyes? I mean, it's not the same weave, obviously, but um, but I mean, like we see a bird get used to like be the eyes of the of the dark one. And it's not a raven, so maybe somehow Morden's attention like startle these flighty birds, which then startles this flighty Ooh, person. I like that. I just thought of that right now. So no, that's I, I don't know. Genius <laughs> the yeah, I think it was dove. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it was a dove. So yeah, so yeah, so she's um she's in the water, floundering. I like that she doesn't freeze. She takes advantage of the air pocket. She tries to get herself out. I do like though, that despite that, she's like, well, I'm not taking my dress off. What happens when I get to the surface? Then I'll be in my shift. So you still see that modesty uh, is still there despite the lower neckline of the dress. She also grew up in a, like a poor village and uh, comparatively to the stuff she's wearing, she's wearing, what she is wearing is culminatively more wealth than Edmondsfield. Yeah. 
and we know that Nynaeve is pretty tight-fisted, so I do like the, like, oh, no, I, I can't leave the jewels here, even though she could probably yeah. retrieve them later. Right, I know, right, like, totally. It's okay, leave, you know, Nynaeve would not be good in an airplane emergency scenario where you're supposed to leave all your stuff behind. She's like, I'm not leaving this behind. Yeah, I, you know, and, but one of the things that I felt like I pointed out is why she, like, she's so good in an emergency situation. She's one of those people that you want to have with you when shit goes wrong because she's there to like immediately turn on and fix it. She panics for like half a second, makes some very quick decisions and that starts going, okay, how am I going to survive this? Everything else is for later. It made me think that, you know, with some more time and temperament, she would make an excellent Amarillin. Mm, mm -hmm. Nynaeve is Amarillin. I would love She would rule with a wise but iron fist. <laughs> She's able to get like through through this emergency moment of like a quick planning and and what to do, but you know also with with the amount of time to like calm down on like how she uses her anger. She also is into the idea of with a little nudging, being more open, uh, like Egwene. Yeah, the thing I noticed about this passage because I mean I love Nynaeve ruling everything, but the thing I noticed here is a foreshadowing of what happens in like just a page. She would drown before losing what's in her pouch. Mm -hmm. That's the ring. Yeah. Like her love of Lan is more than life itself. Like, and she's like, no, I will literally drown before I lose this part of myself, which is also mirrored in her uh, eyes to die test when she's like, take the shawl. If it means I have to give up Lan to get the shawl, I don't want the shawl. Like, I, yeah. So she's, she's stubborn enough to die and she cares a lot about Lan. Yeah. I think it isn't just that. I mean, it is definitely that, but it, the the ring was also like one of the last things that Lan has of his family, and right, right, yeah. So that's it's like really priceless, right? She can't see him and be like, oh yeah, by the way, I ditched your ring at the bottom of a river. Like mm -hmm. I still love you, but your ring didn't make it. Like she's not gonna say that. <laughs> so we've made it about forty minutes before I start trashing Egwene and Gawain, but now I'm gonna trash Egwene and Gawain because. <laughs> So when I was a teenager and I was first reading the series, Egwene and Gawain were my favorite. Like, I just loved them as a couple. And that's why I had reread Like Lightning and Rain multiple times because I was very, very into them. And then as I grew up, I realized, you know, that relationship is kind of trash. Um, Garbage. And, yeah. And uh, then, um, and I think that Lan and Nynaeve are a huge contrast to that. And one way in which that is, you know, what you were both just saying about Nynaeve valuing her relationship above the shawl and above anything else. Egwene is not like that. Mm -hmm. Egwene would give up Gawain before she would put the Aes Sedai in jeopardy um, or even give up her position. Um, and that's it, it. And that's fine. I'm not saying that like she can't you know, choose her career or her other responsibilities over over a partner. But I do think it kind of shows the the sort of differing value and the strength of the of the relationships being different and how sort of in juvenile the attachment is between Egwene and Gawain who don't really establish a real partnership throughout the years of their relationship. Yeah, it, it, it was definitely like two teenagers. Um, I felt like that was so out of place with the writing of like how mature Egwene was. But at the same time, a lot of us can be extremely mature and make stupid relationship you know, decisions. That is though a thing that makes her really good Amarillin, like where she is right now is that she would give up Gawain. And if only she had done so much sooner. Uh, if, only. if only. No, if only. Oh. Yeah, but it, it's like, it's true, like really true, true love. And, and not just like, you know, true love. It's partnership and um, a healthy one as much as we can, can go for. And there's still, like I said, a lot of the 80s tropey romance stuff in it. There's at least mutual respect between Lan and Nynaeve in a way that does not exist with Egwene and Gawain, like, at all. Like, there's no respect in their relationship, whereas in this relationship, you have mutual respect, which is just worlds of quality better. And I mean, Nynaeve and Lan's relationship starts with, you know, admiring each other for their skill set. Mm-hmm you know, Lan essentially being very self-sacrificing in the sense of it doesn't matter, like the best way I can essentially be a partner to you is by not being with you. And okay, let's put aside the fact that he's denying her her agency to make the choice, but it's still about valuing the other person 
above your own needs, which is not something that we really certainly are seeing Gawain ever really capable of doing. You know, when you were saying about Nynaeve valuing Land's ring, not only because of what it means to her as sort of an engagement ring, um, as she says in this chapter, which I love that she just lies about that. Yeah. I love the way that she just lies about two rivers customs to get what she wants. I'm like, you go, you do that. Um, but also this idea that it is an artifact of his childhood and that he just doesn't have those connections to Malkir anymore. And that she is willing to risk her life to care for something that is important to her, her partner. And I think that that's, it really does show the strength and the maturity of that relationship, which by the way, is also not a sexual relationship, mm -hmm. right? Lan and Nynaeve have kissed twice, I think. Yeah. She's oh yeah, but they food. they want it they want it to be sexual. Like, I know that, right? But, <laughs> right. but uh, you know, Nynaeve is very much like not wanting to be forward or you know brazen or anything like that. Whereas Gawain and Egwene's relationship is very sexual um, through the dreams mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. before they have reunited. Uh, and so I do think that that's you know part of that relationship is being very much kind of having the hots for each other. And it's not that a, a, you know Nynaeve and Lan don't want, but Th their relationship is not built on that foundation. Yeah, well, and that's the difference between it being an adult relationship and a teenage one is that it's not like extreme lust and and that's a not much else substance. It's a lot of substance with some very heavy sexual tension that does get resolved, but it only makes it better and they, they end up a stronger partnership instead of just two people clashing and not actually listening to each other. I mean, one of the most touching scenes for Nynaeve and Lan is, um, so I was on the edge of my seat reading the final book. I'm like, I just need Lan to survive. Yeah, like I was I pretty sure Nynaeve was gonna survive, but I need Lan to survive. And Sanderson and Jordan like run, ran me through, I, I, I was just, I couldn't, I could sometimes like was reading the book, like, you know, holding it away from me. Like I couldn't look because I was so worried about Lan dying and I was just so sure he was gonna die. But that scene at the end when Nynaeve, you know, senses that he's there and then we just get a sense of the two of them just holding each other. Yeah. And it's very different from the passionate kiss that they share in book four, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, we made a big deal of on the podcast with the, the bear rug and all the, the, the Lan uh, stuff. <laughs> that was a fun episode, but. Um, it's very different from that, but it really shows, I think, again, just we don't need them to be sexual to appreciate the depth of that relationship. Right. Although I would have liked a little more of that. I know why it wasn't in there, but I would like a little more of that. Just a little more. <laughs> that would have been an interesting difference between Jordan and Sanderson, because Sanderson is, does, just doesn't write that uh, pretty much at all. So um, Jordan doesn't either. You know, not very I, much, but I mean, yeah. we still got, you know, polar igloo sex and yeah uh, so, men in, i mean men in comfort you know harriet yeah. told him that he's not good at sex scenes and that he shouldn't write them so that's why that you don't get a lot of in-depth sex scenes from him harriet. but there i mean there was there was a lot of lead up and then that fade to dark i would have liked that but i feel like we were cheated by not getting the actual wedding because one what yeah. are the seafold customs like that's super cool and and also it's this lead up that we've been getting for books and books and books to finally have this like payoff just being a couple sentences and then an after the fact acknowledgement. It's, I was just like, what? I, I was I so know. mad. I'm still yeah. mad. I'm still I'm mad. And it was like <laughs> 10 years ago that I read this book for the first time. <laughs> More than yeah, that. no, I agree. It's like, give, give me the marriage scene. Also, what would have happened? So um, it's not discussed in this chapter, but we know that part of the sea folk marriage customs are one person gets to lead in private and the other person gets to lead in public. And so Nynaeve is the public leader uh, and uh, Lan is in private. What if they had chosen differently? Because it's also not clear, like they get to choose, I guess, but like, what if Nynaeve had chosen private and Lan had chosen public? I don't oh, that think they been. could have. Yeah, because I don't she's eyes to die and he's watered. They are permanently locked into that arrangement i think and land yeah. doesn't work that way with his eyes that eye like he didn't do that with maureen unless he had to put his foot down and he does with my name at times oh i'm sure it wasn't like an actual discussion but i'm just sort of imagining the world where it's like <laughs> well, you're gonna like you don't get to choose it's like you know um rock paper scissors to figure out who, which, which which one you get or something like that and just how weird it would be to see land come because land you know is should be a king right he would have to command in public um, you know, if he was oh, king yeah, of Malkir, yeah. 
Uh, and I just, I just think that's very funny. That's uh, <laughs> some of the chat just pointed that out. Uh, Frosted Angel in the Sky said that uh, once he's king, though, and and that is the thing, like once he's king. But yeah. then again, I mean, Malkir, the Malkiri people it, are so few, and most of them, like by the end, know Lan and Nynaeve and their dynamic. They might not be. It might not be a miss that he quietly steadfast makes all the just dis- like the big decisions and she does the like like out in the open yeah no the the sea folk power dynamic is uh something we could have done with a lot more pages to explore yeah <laughs> but for for now Nynaeve is has the door stuck down in the mud and is trying to dig her way out and running out of oxygen rapidly And this scene, honestly, every time it gives me so much anxiety, like the shrinking air pocket and the like digging away the mud and being like, no, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a way. Oh, no, it's impossible. I'd have to push the whole boat with my arms. It's just (gasps) so anxiety inducing. Well, one of the advantages of of Nynaeve having the block is even though she's this incredibly overpowered character, as long as the block is still active, we get to experience situations where she isn't powerful at all. And in this case, she can't channel. So she is just sort of a regular person, despite the access that she normally has to this amazing power. And we, you know, we do lose some of that as the books go on. You know, some of the, you know, the early books challenges of things like, how do we get from place to place? I guess we're going to take way gates, right? Oh no, we can't get through the way gates. And then now it's like, oh yeah, we can just travel. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I do kind of, I, one of the things I kind of miss about her not having the block is just sort of this limitation on her abilities that, um, creates real challenges for her to deal with situations. Yeah. It really felt like it was, um, it was relatable, uh, that she was just very human in that moment and very vulnerable and still willing to fight tooth and nail to survive. I, I really, I really liked that too. And that it is sad that you kind of lose it. And it becomes more of like the superhero genre of movies where it's over the top. That terror of being trapped and trying to get out and trying to survive and having something so important to fight for, that's that's extremely relatable. Yeah, and her just like, I will not die. I will not die here. But like, also, I can't get out and there's no hope and there's no land. And, and like, that's what makes her surrender is that she's like, I refuse to die here. And then it's going to be forced on her anyway. And like right. realizing that is the turning point on her block. Like it takes accepting death. Yeah. Embracing death breaks the block. It was yeah. incredibly human and incredibly yeah. land of her. Yes. At the same time. <laughs> no, it's such, it is such this amazing moment in the series. I mean, I mean, Nynaeve's block has been such a huge part of her character and to have it broken like this, but, you know, it's the kind of thing we would speculate about, about, you know, what, how will Nynaeve's block be lifted? And then to have it happen with her embracing death in this moment. And then that Lan happens to be there to kind of help shepherd her out into this next phase, I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Of all the people to help her embrace life again after, it would be Mr. Embrace Death himself. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, important for him. Mm-hmm. Like he needs saving too. And she's there wanting to save him as well. And not just like the way that she says at the end of the chapter, but I think him saving her is the beginning of him being saved. Yeah. Cause now he has something to live for. Yeah. For real. Yeah. And also watching her fight. Yeah. And, and she brings the Malkiri in like, I mean, she just refused. She's like, no, I will not die here. And now I'm attached to you. So you will not die here because you are me. We are one now and we are not dying. Well, and he's important, you know, unlike with Moraine, like he was important to Moraine, but she was very like, the cause is more important than anything else in the world. And I will push you out a window in order to get what we need doing <laughs> or out of the way. So I die. And he didn't get a choice in that. Yeah. You know? And with Nynaeve, he's, he's like not getting a choice, but he, he wants this. And, you know, and later I think about he doesn't get a choice when Nynaeve tricks him into making him ride across the length of the borderlands before he can get to Tarwin's Gap, right? Mm-hmm. But just this one, I love that scene as well. Oh, it's amazing. It's goosebumps. And uh, so when we did the spoiler con fan video, I did Nynaeve and one of the, you know, her big line there, you know, uh, when you ride alone was, you know, I, I love doing that. And it was you know, very, very cool. But when I think about that scene, I think about, here is someone who loves this person so much 
that she is going to fulfill the need he sees for himself, right? He needs to do this. This is part of who he is. And a lesser woman in a lesser relationship would say, no, no, I can't risk you that way. I, you know, I, you know, you're too, you know, the thought of you dying is too much for me. I can't let you do this thing that you need to do. And I need doesn't do that. She fulfills what he needs to do for himself, but she gives him his best chance. Um, and, and just that kind of sense of being a true partner of, she doesn't like it. She would rather keep him by her side, but she recognizes that that is not what he needs. And she's putting his needs above hers, but with a twist. Right. There will be compromise here. <laughs> Fortunately, Lan was right behind her for this whole thing because she might have drowned in the river even after busting out of the boat. But he, he, I love how he just follows her in this whole like scene. He's just like, Egwene sent me to Abu Dhar. The second that I figured out where you were, I just tried to get to you. Like, I didn't try to meet up with you at a bar at a convenient time later. I was just going to you like an arrow to a target and like boat vanishes under the water, take off boots, dive into water. Like he doesn't know what the situation is, but he just goes for it. And without him doing that, she still could have died Yeah. in this scene. Um. Cause I mean, she comes out in a burst of water, but like she's deep enough in the water that she's not necessarily going to bob to the surface and have the cognizance to like breathe and swim and all that. Yeah. He's got to tug her by, his, by her braid. Right. And like give her a little bit of like, you know, the rib squeezing, like here, you need air in your lungs. And like, I do find the part where she punches him hard enough to bruise a little hard to believe because she's out of it and she's in the water. And I feel like water would slow down your punch, but I'm also really bad at punching. So maybe that's just my bias. Yeah, well, I mean, it it could, but well, like a dying animal when it's that thrashing that can be pretty forceful. Or yeah, the fear of death, like Seth's saying, drowning victims can get scary strong. Yeah. I've never done lifeguarding. I just needed rescued by one once. <laughs> it's uh <laughs> that that pump of adrenaline can can make you do pretty amazing things. Um I wasn't crazy about them uh, about like just the fact that she punches him, <laughs> but I thought it was still kind of you know, when she realizes that she did like, oh my God, and, and then fixes it immediately. She goes through all these emotions uh, in the very, very, in like two pages, you know, she's, um, you know, sick, then she's uh, super happy, or no, for, well, then she's like upset and embarrassed, and then she's super happy because Lan is there, and she's giggling, and then she's embarrassed again because the oarsmen think that, you know, she's worried about what they think, and then she's angry because Lan is, uh, given his bond to someone else. I mean, it's really like in two pages, she's just all over the place. And maybe that is partly the adrenaline of almost dying, right? That she's mm -hmm. just experiencing all these different emotions, but it's, uh, it's these lightning qu quick changes. In almost dying, finally seeing him again. I mean, it's been a long time. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'd be exhausted. And it's just like, she, she was willing to, you know, try to punch a shark in the face. I mean, like, you know, she's definitely in an extreme state. <laughs> I do want to ban Jordan's use of the phrase something odd, right? So Nynaeve delves Lan and says that, uh, you know, he's got new scars and there was something odd. And then, you know, later on, uh, you know, there's, of course, with Avienda, um, you know, the something odd about, you know, her, preg you know, her, her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm just spoiling left and right. Sorry, people. That's what it's you get. In the podcast. Spoilers title. podcast. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's just sort of like, is the something odd just the the fact that the bond has shifted, or is there something else that's something odd about Lan? I, I thought it was the the bond has shifted that it wasn't Maureen and that it was Myrell. I, I thought, I thought right. it was it was the the death sadness from mm -hmm. Maureen dying. It's that magic depression thing. I think she would pick up on that because she's really like good at healing. I think it's more that something odd is in someone, someone's presence is there that isn't, wasn't before. <laughs> How much she didn't, did she ever even delve him before? I mean, does she even know what a bonded warder's like bonded part of his brain feels like to delving? Yeah. I don't know if she's delved anyone who's a warder. Has she, she, she hasn't been back to see Ran since he got bonded. Mm -mm. Um, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, do you think that Nynaeve would be able to heal that? about a warder um the the breaking of the bonds and she's able to heal so many other things it seems she like thinks she can okay with 
Daigion after Eben oh, dies. Right. She's like, I could heal this. And Daigion's like, back up. This is sacred grief. Go away. Right. So she pain. thinks she can. Okay. I don't, <laughs> I don't, whether I don't, or not she can, I don't know. Right. I don't think she can. Yeah. But I mean, and she cures land through, you know, more um, traditional means of like, no, you do have something to live for. Stop being so like stuck in this rut. And also, I mean, yeah, land's very gone. I mean, it's magic depression, but it, it can be worked through much like stilling, right? Like stilling or gentling, like mostly it kills you from despair, but there are ways to get around it through having a life's purpose. And Nynaeve uses that route with Lan. It's not like, you know, there's a, a lack of chemical in his brain or body or something is going wrong. It's that he's going through something that's very natural and normal and it's amplified by the magic. So, you know, maybe she can like dampen it but I think the only way that he can go through that is the way that they do which is the traditional way of getting through grief is finding something to live right, going for. through it right and then the whole time you're like she's not even dead right, no, <laughs> you know? right. but it's you know the bond is it has elements of compulsion in it and the bond was snapped in ways that trigger yeah. the compulsion to and it's it's a it's like um when Leandrin gets compelled to to live right like this is something you would do anyway and the compulsion is reinforcing that natural pattern. So it's really strong. I did want to ask, do we, is this the first time we learn that the water bond can give you extra, the ability to hold your breath for a very long time? I think so. I'm not sure if that's mentioned as a water ability before. I'm assuming that's a water ability. I mean, either it's just his sheer stoicism. I think it's just because he's Batman. <laughs> it's just land. It's Batman. Just, yeah. it's Batman. But I mean, he does. I mean, warders get more endurance. So why would a more efficient use of oxygen not be part of that? Yeah. Yeah. He's um, also a big guy. So he's probably has like reasonably large lungs and he's got great cardiovascular health. So you're saying he has endurance? Yeah. I'm now like imagining the warder breath holding competitions. Like, is it like <laughs> four <or>? minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we lost a few. <laughs> Yellows. Right. Yeah. <laughs> totally. When her the way that she touches Lan is like it's when they're finally up, like the way that she's with him, it's it's again, it's like it's written a lot more like a real relationship. It's so relatable. Uh yeah. the way that she's just like checking him and seeing if he's okay. And it's I think I think one of the best instances of Jordan showing love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the way she's like touching his face and like he's so beautiful. And then like she's not giggling, but somebody's giggling. It's just like that's a mood. <laughs> I mean, of all the relationships in the Wheel of Time, this is the one that I always come back to that feels the most real to me. It's the one I reread every scene of their relationship. You know, and and there's no, there are other pairings that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, like, you know, Perrin and Fayil get more screen time, um, but they also have a lot more of those 80s tropes that you're talking about, uh, Ariel. And uh, so I, and I, don't enjoy that relationship nearly as much and it, and it starts too fast for me it goes very much through the Beatrice and Benedict of it all and then all of a sudden they're together and I'm like um why mm. yeah it's rather toxic w what exactly toxic. right uh like she thinks like his shoulders but that's about it <laughs> right like I always shipped Perrin and Egwene I like yeah. I just oh, always yeah. wanted those two to be together like she would have lived like he it just it's so many good things would have happened. could have been serious dream like engineering buddies oh they're like yeah their children would have been like amazing if they had any but yeah yeah things that might have been no other when I think about all the other pairings I you know, there are things that I like about some of the pairings um but I just you don't really get that same depth of appreciation for who the other person is and what they bring to the table um and going through a lot of things and making sacrifices for each other and what the other person needs um and I just yeah it's just such a it it to me it's a huge part of why I love this series uh the realness of this relationship between the two of them right and well and whenever I've recommended the series it's because of getting up to certain scenes and points that I think people would enjoy. And this is one of them uh, that is, I, I think one of the draws to like, yeah, get in the series because you get to this point. I think the cleansing of uh, Satan is also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think the other thing about it, and this gets back to the point about, you know, that we don't get the wedding. I think that's part of why we're annoyed. It's like, this is the culmination of 
books of relationship building and we don't even really get that point it's just you know this and then cut to you know Nynaeve and Lan walking in and Matt being like why would you want to marry Nynaeve you know um and we just totally miss it and that I think is the point of frustration is that when you've invested so much of yourself in this fictional relationship and then you don't even get the wedding right you know how many yeah. films have taught us the wedding is the culmination and I'm glad it's not that I'm glad we get a lot of post-wedding with Nynaeve and, and Lan um but still for sure Right. I, I don't, we don't get the wedding. We don't get the wedding night, which there's like, come on, the tension's been building for so freaking long. Like, um, yeah. And one of the chat super Skylake had brought up, imagine Perrin with the warder bond powering that like the power up of the warder bond, like, oh man, who would have been unstoppable yeah. and their children's ability to like dream walk. <sighs> yeah. That would have been out of control. Yeah. Amazing. So now I'm thinking about weddings and I'm like, whose weddings do we get to see? We get Perrin and Fail. I think we that's get one. Talonvor and yeah. um Morgays. Well Yeah, Morgays. Um we get a uh, Loyal and Aerith. Yeah. On um, on screen weddings, right? Yeah. Is that it? Do we get into their on screen weddings? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think that's it. That's yeah. really paltry. Yeah. Not a lot. Especially for all the lead up for all those characters. Yeah. Like right, just... yeah. It's one thing to not write sex scenes, but it's another thing to never pay off. Right. Right. Not that you have to like have the wedding, but they're just there. They're that payoff of what a wedding is, isn't there, except for Perrin and Fail. And I feel like that one was really like payoffy and it felt good. And I, that was the moment where I was like, ah, oh, maybe I like them. And then afterwards, I was like, nope, still don't like them together. <laughs> you know <laughs> but like you know as much as I rag on Gawain and Egwene as well like we just suddenly find out that they just got married and again that's fine that's their like I'm not taking away their choice of how to you know get married or anything I'm not saying yeah not everyone doesn't have to have a big wedding but it is weird that we don't get any weddings like real like big weddings in this mm -hmm. series given how many relationships there are that span the entire course of the series Right, yeah. and, and lead up to that point. And, and it, with Egwene and Gawain, it really did feel like a shotgun kind of teenager thing. Like, is yeah. she pregnant? Right, because um, like, like, we can't sleep together in real life until my mother says we can, even though well, we definitely yeah. did way nasty things in the dream, like repeatedly. Right, well, and that's kind of the whole thing throughout the series is like everybody can't sleep together unless they're married, and that's silly. Like, so. Yeah, yeah. I like that she does pull him aside and they have that conversation in the cabin like afterwards and it is a like a deep conversation and then he gets to the point which is really nice um and it's just like immediately like hey i'm bonded to somebody else again it's very 80s with her slapping him not okay domestic violence is never good friendos you know he's trying to save her some pain um and she's like just, i will show you pain <laughs> I was going to say though, it's, it's definitely not the, um, the worst eighties relationshipy, uh, bad trope that we see in this. Uh, oh yeah. He didn't spank her. So we're like, we're better in that respect. Although I think he threatens it later, but I remember giggling and reading that scene. Cause she was like aghast at like land spanking her. I was like, I want to read that. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> she sure could yeah. destroy <laughs> him. <laughs> But um, what is interesting is the way, what Lance says, he says, um, uh, you know, Murel holds my bond now. She is lending me to you until you find a warder of your own. That's a very interesting way to uh, um, express what happened. But, um, yeah, you know, just leaving so, Egwene out of it completely. Yeah. No, no, Egwene <laughs> wasn't involved in that. Morel decided um, this on her own. Totally. And, you know, Nynaeve probably never learns that Egwene is responsible for land being there you know that she owes her that right well i mean moraine technically set the whole thing up with morel so that she he, he would get to nynaeve so like it's not totally lying to just leave Egwene's participation out <laughs> no it's land is being very i said i here right he's yeah. he's not lying but he's also not you know giving nynaeve the whole story there when Egwene is very much not about taking taking the kudos for everything she's just about getting the right thing done in the right amount of time as efficiently and as fast as possible and that is something I love about her and she's not she's not there to get the thanks she's there yeah. to get it done right uh and to corral cats 
like an art director, you know? <laughs> Um, I do like, uh, I just, I just want to point out that um, Sakan is in the, the chat and said that Games of, Game of Thrones has made him very wary of weddings. Um, that's yeah, fair. That's, that's fair. That is fair. But we also don't have political weddings in this series. We have weddings of love. We don't have weddings of kingdoms, which is nice. I mean, we actually. do, but those are love matches. Right, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, the series is more fanciful and less like, just ripped from history and then put dragons on top. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just put some dragons in there. It'll be fine. Yeah. But yeah, so she's pretty um, upset again when she finds out about Mirel, partially because she knows the stories of how Mirel is with her warders. And uh, so I mean, really just jealous. And I love that. Like she, as prudish as she can be and as like worried about everything as she can be that she turns around and she's like, okay, fine. You know, we're going to get married. This is not a question. Uh, I'm going to be with you. It's not a question. Oh my God. She can feel everything you feel. And her immediate reaction is how do I get her to know it's me? <laughs> can, like, can you be sure? <laughs> can you just send along a little tag? <laughs> yeah. That was like, I remember closing the book and like hackling because it is so amazing. And I was like, I would say that, like, <laughs> I love this. I love this about them and that she's, she's growing. And that's, I think that was a really good growth moment too, for her. Cause nine, eight from book one would not have said or done something no. like that. But the fact that she is at this point and she's this confident in her love for him and she's this confident in herself and she's not afraid of, you know, a forsaken that she's like, yeah, okay, fine. She's going to feel what you're going to feel. Like I'm going to make her feel stuff, you know, <laughs> okay with that, right. Um, also, uh, Aradia, I just want to note that a uh, good trivia question. What animal does Lan compare Nynaeve to when she says that she wants uh, Ooh, to go That would be a good trivia question. Because I always yeah. misremember what he says. Uh, and I'm not going to say it because it's going to be a trivia question. <laughs> nice. I already forgotten. I just read the chapter again like two hours ago. <laughs> I know. Ago. I was like, wait, I actually just had to check oh. again. I was like, is it that? Nope, nope, nope. It's not that. <laughs> so like right in the... Right yeah. in that conversation. Yep. And then this the, the part I like about this conversation too is that Lan goes from giving her the title of Mashiara, his lost love, which is this like absolute depth of despair, to on the next page, his first proper belly laugh since Moraine died because of that comment about can you tell her that it's me? And it's like, okay, you've hit your nadir. You are coming up the other side now. Like in in this conversation you have actually hit the bottom and now we're coming up because you have regained your lost love lost no longer yeah and she's determined to make sure that you know he's not going to die and she's going to take care of him like and there's hope like the darkness can leave his eyes it comes back but like there is hope and as a healer right like she can see that like that that is a path to healing him yeah, it's just, it's oh, it's such a great chapter for build. Jordan just does such a good job in building this relationship through conversation. You know, you said that earlier, Ariel, about communication. And, you know, so many of the other relationships are defined by characters not talking to each other. I mean, let's take Elaine and Rand, who we, we like, they spend three days together in tear, and then they don't see each other forever, but they're in love. And I'm like, mm, yeah. are you? Yeah, like, and maybe then they, they have... fall in love later, but... Right. And then they have sex once, once, and she gets pregnant. And like, that's, and that's it. I like, I was so as a, as a teenage girl, like I was so angry about that, that I was like, oh no. And then she, and then it never writes that she has sex again. And you never even read that her babies are born. Like that ends with her still pregnant. Like I was so impressed the, that she, the books ended with her pregnant. I'm like, you no, you can't, you, you, oh. Yeah, well, that gets us into the timeline issue of how like the last five books take place over the course of like a week or whatever it is. It just just it depends on how close you are to the boar. <sighs> um, but even yeah, uh, no, I think it it is really interesting the lack of communication between other characters. I mean, a uh, uh, and Gawain, my always my go to punching bag, um, who you know meet in book two, don't see each other between books three and six, but she's in love with him and wants to marry him and. You know, no wonder it feels like lightning and rain. Um, no, it's not real. Uh, it's not a good writing uh, technique. The lack of communication is not, I, I feel like that was, he showed a spot where he was weak in his writing is, is the lack of communication was something that, that pushed the, the plot forward. 
I think it would have been more less frustrating for the readers to, to read if it had been, oh, they're communicating, but it's still going wrong because that's yeah. like, yeah, plenty of people are bad communicators, but you know, this is, it's pretty bad. Like yeah. all of his skill was piled into this chapter for that yeah. kind of communication. <laughs> Spread it out. <laughs> and it, but all of Nine Even Land's big scenes are like this, right? So if we think about the scene in book two, um, you know, when he first gives her the ring or first of all, the, the scene in book one, right? Where they first kind of confess that they have feelings for each other. And then in book two, when he gives her the ring and then in book uh, four, when uh, in the leave taking chapter, or, right? When they're leaving in the kiss and everything. Okay, and that one is like less conversationally because Egwene and Elaine are there, um, but there's still kind of his vow that he won't survive her long as she dies in Chanchigo and, and him wanting to go with her to Chanchigo and allusions to previous conversations that they've had. And then we jump to this, right? Those are the key moments in their relationship and they're all built around this kind of conversation and, and communication between the two of them. And I just, it's just, that's why I have reread all of those chapters. That's why off the top of my head, I know all those scenes because they're so compelling and there's no other relationship in this series that is comp as compelling as that when it comes to just two characters who are just able to talk to each other about their needs and what they want and able to resolve the, the challenges that they have in their relationship. And that they have that this moment where in the cabin where they do have those communications and decide, okay, this is this is what we're gonna do. And he's not fighting her on it because because he could like he could fight her on it, um, and and leave and not marry her. But he wants that, like he actually wants it. And deep down, I think Lan doesn't want to die. No, he wishes he didn't have to die. He thinks he has to, but that doesn't mean he wants to. Right. And yeah, yeah. And then he's like, oh, Nynaeve, you're so stubborn. Oh, you're twisting my arm. Oh, I guess I'll be your husband. Fine. <laughs> and before he met Nynaeve, he was fine with dying. He just sort of, you know, he had, he's embraced death and the understanding that it will come to him, but he didn't really have much of a reason to fight that, um, to want to, you know, to maybe not want to, to die. Uh, and, and it's great to see the way in which he doesn't compromise that side of himself, right? He still has accepted, you know, death and, and up to the, you know, last, uh, his last scene in, in, in the last book, you know, and he, he pursues that. But, um, you know, with, uh, with Nynaeve, like it really does, she really does give him a reason to want to choose a different path. Yeah, very much so. He's so great. I love them. <laughs> yeah. This makes me happy. You know, I don't reread the books as often as I used to, but like anytime I'm feeling down, I will pick up one of the books that has a good Nynaeve Land scene and read it. And it just makes me feel better. Yeah, it's it's good. Yeah, so the, just to wrap up, they they head back to the docks and then he was like, turn this boat around. We are going to go get married. Also, I have a meeting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the done. thing about Mogedi and I can, I can beat her. Yeah, she's got and shit to get done. She discovers that she has lost her block. She didn't really realize that for the past 10 minutes, but she suddenly is like, Oh, I don't have a block anymore. That's pretty neat. And Land's like, yeah, that's that's pretty neat. Yeah. I almost yeah. don't hate that. That's actually pretty cool. I mean, like, I have to say that if I had almost drowned and found out that it was because one of the big bads of the universe is after me, and then also reunited with my my love and convinced that we're getting married, like I would be like, okay, that's enough for today. <laughs> yeah. Go back to the inn and relax, read a book, like take a bubble bath. Like, that's it. I'm done. And I need like, nope. <laughs> gotta go to a meeting gotta get married probably have five other things on the to-do list let's start checking them off right oh and she has to think about the fact that four bodyguards died protecting her and she's like oh i should have thought of that sooner oops but i love that she does and then she brings that up and she's not just like all wrapped up in herself uh in this moment and it's just a good reminder of who she is and that she does care and and i love that she's sitting on his knee and they're laughing together that she's broken her block and it's so like Oh, they deserve this moment. Like they really deserve this moment. Anyone would forgive her for suggesting that, you know, they go off somewhere together. I mean, I know because she, she doesn't know that they're going to get married by the sea folk. Yeah, she she thinks that she she's curious about their customs. She's curious about their customs, right? She says she thinks that somebody on that boat can marry them, right? But, you know, if she had wanted to just kind of like go off of land and put that meeting off to the next day, Mm -hmm. right because remember Nynaeve tried to get out of it Nynaeve tried to get Elaine and Evian to do it mm -hmm. Nynaeve does not want to do this this is a built-in perfect excuse to get out of it but Nynaeve 
thinks is as strongly motivated by duty and responsibility as Lan is, which is why they are such a, one of the many reasons why they're such a good match. So even though she does not want to do it, even though she has every reason in the world not to, she's still like, no, we got to go do that right now. Right. Maybe we can do this other thing I want to do while we're there, but that's, we got to do this. Yeah. She's just like, I'm going to go meet with important people. Surely one of them also has the power to, to marry us while we're there discussing, you know, the fate of the climate seems reasonable. And then it works out. And then they're bound to customs from a culture, not their own, that they have no idea what they're walking into, which is, which is quite the story, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I relate to my name in this. Like I, I would totally do that would just be like, okay, now I have meetings to do. And also like, let's be as efficient as possible. You know, there's a captain on the ship. I'm sure that they can marry us and we'll get all the things done. It will be very productive. <laughs> it's a very full day, but she's going to make it a wonderful day. Like does not matter how much she almost died. This is going to be a good day. Yeah. But you do after this really want them to have like, a, I don't know, a, a while, not, not just a week, like just they need like a year honeymoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go on retreat somewhere. But that's not who they are. No, but they might take a week. That would be extreme. Maybe at them. the end of everything. <laughs> I would, I would say like maybe at the end of everything after the books, but no, I mean, they have a kingdom to rebuild and people to help and refugees and What's the best honeymoon destination in Raymond? Mm. Good question. Um, um, hmm. I mean, the reflowering Malkir would be really like, you know, unbuilt up. So it'd be really like nice nature because mm -hmm. everything's growing. Right. Um, oh, Mayan hasn't been destroyed at the end of the last battle because that's mm -hmm. where the hospital is. So Mayan, that's warm and non-destroyed so that would say be like yeah beachy beachy stuff <laughs> say maybe the the land of shanshan because it's an island ish and uh everyone's gone um right. <laughs> yeah, yeah the of mad fun. men <laughs> tremble king yeah i think yeah. i think tremble king or maybe they should go to a steading so that way like the power is just not part of the picture <laughs> just like any steading would be gorgeous yeah, the not one of the ones where the dark friends are being held. i love the idea of the steading is like set up as resorts Anyway, sorry, that was, uh, it's a totally off topic question, but it just, it just occurred to me. I'm thinking about the landscape itself, not, not the bodies, not all the corpses. Yeah, Tremalking does have the whole mass suicide. Thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. But, but uh, if you look at it on the map, it's a nice spot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Maybe we could uh, rebrand Shatter Loga. I yeah. mean, that's just a big pit in the ground, so, yeah, you know. See, there's a lot ready for development. <laughs> Cheap <lot>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, say a Budar would be interesting, but yeah, it's yeah. also yeah, or like you know, one of those like Toman Head, you know, it's like rustic, you know, like small little villages. But of course, it's Shan Chan territory, so well, again, not, not great. Yeah, for the most I mean, part, they're gone. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but we can move on to the kin now. I just wanted to make sure we hit all the plot points of the last other thing. But yeah, um, the kin getting slapped down by Elaine, <laughs> which is fun. I, I love this. I, I love how uh, Elaine, you know, that Elaine gets to come and come in and after they like kicked her out because there's no way she's eyes to die. And mm -hmm. she comes in and, and even then they're like, oh, oh no, uh, you know, I don't know what this young woman has told you, eyes to die. And they're like, um, she's our leader. Yeah, that's a little awkward. I was gonna say, I also love um, how as they're walking up to it, she Elaine is like, you know, about to go flex her authority and like do this big adult thing. And she's thinking about how she wishes she could wear one of these like three feather outfits because everyone else is doing it and it looks kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's still like really young. Yeah. It's just, it's a hilarious dichotomy of like this really frivolous, really childish thing. And then also like this major power flex that changes the dynamic of the women who can channel for this whole part of the world for like the rest of the age. Right. Again, and it, it like you see Egwene's fingers in this whole chapter, uh, and mm. it's another one of those instances where Egwene put the right people because a good leader delegates properly, and she put the right people in the right place, and you know was like, yeah, include these people. These rules are stupid. We're literally dying out because we're so stringent on who we let in and who we don't into the into the White Tower. So. Yeah, I mean, bringing the kin in is a huge deal. So in political science, there's this, uh, in many disciplines, but we talk a lot about um, institutional path dependence. So this idea that institutions, once they are created and on a particular path, that they tend to follow along that path, which is why often you see that when 
if you create institution to solve a problem and then that problem gets solved, the institution doesn't get tend to dissolve. It tends to rebrand itself to meet new problems because like the institution continues. And whenever I think about the eyes to die pre Egwene, I always think about this idea of path dependence, right? That the eyes to die structure continues and evolves in this particular way and is not able to kind of change itself very easily because it's continuing down this particular path of development. And then, and then you get a Gwen come in as this disruptive force who changes the organization and forces them to change for the better, right? So um, there's this comment, they, they give us some numbers in this chapter, right? So Rianne tells us that there are 1,783 members of the kin. And when the I said I express sort of surprise at that, um, Rianne's response is, oh, you, you expected, more? expected more? Well, accidents do take some every year or, or natural deaths as with everyone else. I fear the kin have grown, few, have grown fewer in the last thousand years. And right, they're like, right. uh, no, no, no. Uh, Elaine's like, no, we're not disappointed. Not at all. Uh, that's great. Um, <laughs> and, she, and she notes that like, there's, almost twice as many kin as there are Aes Sedai. Right. Um, and that's just in the kin, right? We obviously know there are other groups of channelers out there. You know, the Aiel aren't sending their women. The Sea Folk aren't really, are only sending a few. Um, obviously in Sean Chan, right? As well as all of the other, you know, women who just never get tested, but could have been able to learn. And it's amazing the way that you have this closed off sense of power. Um, that has been limited to an elite few. And Egwene essentially kind of democratizes it and says, no, anyone who wants to learn and is able to can learn. Right. And it's again, a, you know, a good leader looking to delegate resources and looking to maximize the efficiency of her resources and saying, no, you're over 20. You can't become I said I is just stupid. It's inefficient and it's limiting themselves. So for her to come in and be like, yeah, what, so what you're older, that means you have more experience and yeah, you're going to have some blocks and stuff, but okay. Yeah. And like you said, also delegating, you know, she didn't delegate this mission to an established Aes Sedai who knows the institution. She delegated to one of her friends who's as much of a firebrand as she is and is like, what rules? I'm just going to do the thing. And like that creates compounding disruption to shake up the old order. Well, also someone who's going to implement what Egwene wants to happen and isn't going to try to fulfill her own agenda here, right? So, you know, because we get this bit where Elaine says that the other Aes Sedai, you know, tried to talk her out of this um, and that she she had to really hold firm on this, uh, this idea of inviting. And, and we're, we're not told exactly what she had to fight against them, but it's clear that it's this idea of inviting the kin to be part of the White Tower. And you know, the other Aes Sedai are not happy about this upending of their order. But what I notice in this scene is how you have Rianne go from a, a groveling mess, right? She says, you know, forgive us Aes Sedai. Her voice was worshipful, worshipful and only a little steadier than her knees had been. You know, she babbled in fact, you know, so she's just groveling. Um, and eager to help the Aes Sedai in any way that she can. She begs forgiveness of Elaine, and Elaine is finally like, stand up, like, stop. Too much. <laughs> right, too much, right? So this is how we start with them, you know, this kind of fear of the Aes Sedai, this feeling of unworthiness. And then when Elaine tells them that they can be part of the tower, we get to this point where Elaine says, those who can learn to become Aes Sedai will have the chance and there will be a place for all, for any woman who can who channel. Unshed tears shone in Rianne's eyes. Elaine was not sure, but she thought the woman whispered, I can be green. Yeah, I remember getting a little very like. It was hard not to rush over, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I actually kind of, you know, I can be green is such a, like for me is a great quote, but just this idea of the way that they move just in this one chapter from the groveling and everything to realizing they can be part of it to the way the kin respond much later in the book series where they like are over the Aes Sedai and think that they're like a bunch of squabbling fools. I love that development of them as a group, but I love in this scene, the way they go from, you know, these people are so above us to, oh, I can be one of them. I can be green. 
It's the kind of whiplash that Nynaeve goes through. I mean, not that Nynaeve goes from groveling to ecstatic, but like that's an intense emotional whiplash to go from like, I am about to be skinned alive by these demigods to I could become a demigod too. What? <laughs> and for a woman who's 412 years old. I know, right? I mean, who spent centuries, you know, wishing she could be green and is now going to have the opportunity to, you know, to pursue that dream. I mean, like someone who had lost all hope of being able to pursue it and, and now is given that hope again. I think it's just, it really is this amazing moment in the series. This chapter is just full of amazing moments. Yeah. yeah. But it isn't just like her amazing moment, it's for all of them and that they all have this hope over something that was so, so dumb. And, you know, it was just another thing that made me respect Elaine and Egwene so much more. And like, yeah, they know what they're doing because they don't have these established people who are who are really stuck in their ways. Yeah, for sure. It's a huge asset for the tower that they don't care about convention. And it's really nice. <laughs> And you wonder like how it changes everything from after this, you know, after the series ends, because there are, is now an opportunity to be so many more Aes Sedai and to really build up the tower and really build up not just them, but the, the Ashaman's tower and how like, you know, we could get back to the age of legends because of Egwene, because she was like, no, I'm not going to let us die out. You know, you guys can we need to get as many people who can learn and we need to get people who can learn together, working together. <laughs> well, but not just building up the, the tower, the towers, but also the ability to then send people out to actually bring those powers to serve the community, right? The fact that there <sighs> aren't fun. yellows stationed all over the world to, I mean, to help deal. I mean, imagine having a yellow who comes through even once a month um, into agricultural world so that anyone who broke a limb or something that they can heal it and they can move on, um, you know, or having setting up hospitals regularly that you have yellows at, you know, and, and I mean, and, and having grays out there to help with negotiation and mediation um, or to, I don't know, act as lawyers. Uh, right. Like what are they really even doing for the world? As I said, I, other than meddling with Kings. No, that's what they're so elitist. And they don't, you know, you have a few that go out and leave the tower, but those are mostly blues um, who, you know, when, and when you think about it, you know, blues are going out and about fulfilling the causes they care about. You know, it's mm -hmm. again, it's very much self-involved. I mean, yes, Maureen is, is great, but Maureen is, you know, very much a rogue agent that's going about fulfilling her, her, her vision of how things should work. Um, and, you know, if Maureen had found uh, Rand sooner, and gotten him back to the tower sooner so that maybe he grew up in the tower, right? That might not have been a good thing. Yeah. Um, no. No. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that the world would have been saved. Yeah. So having, you know, the kin and other groups around to provide, I don't know, some diverse set of experiences and a diverse set of perspectives would be pretty damn great for the Aes Sedai, I think, in, in the long run. Yeah. To say nothing of the whole, like, you could retire into the kin scheme, which, you know, who knows if, how that would work with the oath rod and all that, but like, it's a potential that's there. Like you could have outlier towers, you can have a retirement tower, you can have recruitment that's happening. Like there's so much that the kin bring to the table that the eyes that I just can't manifest for themselves. Well, and that's the other big thing that it points that this chapter points out, especially the, like the last few sentences that when she says how many, like how old she is, that, you know, they don't know at this point that it's the oath rod, but there is a difference between Aes Sedai and regular channelers that is pretty noticeable, that the agelessness is not the source and that the uh, lifespan is cut short. And I think that that was a really big, like, oh, what if they changed and they don't use the oath rod and, you know, they could live longer. Right. But well, do you the, really need to live that long? <laughs> yes. But also the, the whole use of the oath rod, right, was because people started to mistrust Aes Sedai um, because of their past history. You know, you needed the oath rod so that people would really believe that they weren't going to do those things. And it's very possible that after the last battle, those are not as necessary anymore. Right. To bind them that way. To bind them as criminals, right? Right, but at the same time, society still teaches, treats them like 
they are liars anyway, and they're just out to fool you anyway. So why, why keep doing the oath rod? Because it, it's not helping the situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's that institutional pathway thing you were talking about. Like they are trying to preserve how the Aes Sedai were in the age of legends. That's what the whole white tower has been about. And then the kin, their group that like the Aiel and the Seat book, they have adapted with the times. Like they are more modern channelers in many senses. Well, this is one of the big themes of the book, right? Is about the corruption of history into le legend and myth um, and how what we think the way the world worked in the past is not how it actually worked. And what's fascinating in the series, right, is that we do get characters who did live in those times and who can actually give us more accurate information. But through these efforts to preserve customs of the past and to try to do things as, as you know, in accordance with history, and the Sean Chan are a great example of that, right? We're reclaiming Arthur Hawkwing's lands, right? Okay, from 500 years ago, good luck with that. Right, but that's this is huge theme of the series about the dangers of doing that, of trying to rely on your understanding of an incomplete history and trying to fulfill some kind of through line from that and the dangers that poses and then the value of disruptive divergent thinking um, into that process and realizing that actually if you're willing to let go of these long standing customs um, that don't necessarily fit the times, uh, you can build a better society. I have a, a question. I'm curious, like, do you think in this moment, this conversation and bringing the kin into the ace that I is one of the biggest things that Elaine will do in her lifespan, like world changing things? It's a pretty big thing. I mean, and bringing in all of the Turan Grial, which gives her a lot of engineering food for thought. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm like, so like, what are the big accomplishments of Elaine's life in the series, right? So she's able to create Terang Real. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is huge. It's no, it's big, right? But and I'm not I'm not trying to it's not this it, big, but, but it's yeah. not world changing, right, right? right? We could get by okay, particularly it's good that she's able to make copies of Matt's medallion, right? That's very right, valuable. right, right, right. In, in terms of you know ensuring the survival of multiple characters, um, right? Does does Lan use he uses a copy, right? I think he so. doesn't have yeah. yeah yeah. So I mean that's you know so so good. Elaine preserves Lan's life. That's her most important. <laughs> <one>. uh, <laughs> but no, I do think that you know leading Andor. I mean I don't know that Andor really needed Elaine. I mean given that it Caitlin gets completely overrun because Elaine leaves. I mean, Dylan was there as a perfectly competent. Dylan player. would have been fine to lead uh, Andor. So, um, I, I mean, I think that the two main things would be the the Turing Grial and and the work that she does with the kin. Um, but I think that in terms of long lasting um, society changing efforts, the kin would be number one. Yeah, and uh, Super Sky Lake brought up the the dragons were a big thing as well, uh, well and I think that too. Writes, yeah. That, that would also, you, you're starting to see the beginnings of the industrial age, essentially, which I think is one of Rand's biggest accomplishments is pushing the, the school and the trains and like the industrial age forward. Uh, that's all stuff that I felt like, man, this is so interesting. It's going to go somewhere so interesting. And then like the book ends series ends <laughs> i think that elaine and the dragons I mean, the dragons are very important but i think if dylan had been friend, had been um queen of andor that you know she may have also been willing to fund the dragons right because Agreed. it's not like yeah. elaine just gives matt the money she secures rights to the dragons for andor um i mean i would i would put the dragons in uh the matt camp and the, and the rand camp right uh yeah. of an accomplishment yeah. No, yeah. Bringing the kin in is not something that Elaine had to do. It's not something that was inevitable and she does it. And it, yeah, the number of people whose lives that changes, like how, how do you change that many lives in a single conversation? Right. And they're, they're old lives and they're going to live a long time. So they're going to affect a lot more of the world because let's say they do set up hospitals and they can do it because they have the kin. But um, yeah. So Elaine, says so now do you know about the bowl of the winds which is like the <laughs> fifth time she's asked like for real can you please trust us with this information please Rianne's like okay fine we don't touch them we never touch them like promise pinky swear we don't mess with them but yeah we probably have your bowl over over in this place is this the first mention that Elaine hears of the storeroom that it's not just the bowl yeah 
Yeah, it is. It is. And, and then as the conversation happens, Matt comes waltzing in being like, by the way, I found a warehouse that looks like it's full of junk you might be interested in. And Elaine's immediate instinct is to, you know, rain on his parade and be like, oh, we already know. Yeah. Which I hate. Like, I yeah. hate that too. I yeah. hate the way they treat Matt. Oh my God. It's so frustrating. I love that Brigitte's there just giving her like psychic stink eye. Yeah. <laughs> but then she does, she stops. And I feel like she does try to make like throughout the series from here, like try to be like, thank you. I appreciate what you did. You know, and I think it wasn't so much like her trying to stamp on Matt. It was like, here he comes again. Yes. This man to steal my moment. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah. And I do think that that shows, you know, some of Elaine's maturity, right? In that there's plenty of situations in life where someone who aggravates you comes in and your immediate response is to lash out at them. And sometimes you do need someone to kind of remind you that's not how we should be responding to that person. And so, you know, Elaine does need Brigitte here to kind of do that for her, but she does get better at that throughout the series of kind of like taking stock and remembering, actually, I shouldn't respond that way. And then she throws in that like, oh, Brigitte's my, my warder, not him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and when they're like, is he your warder? And she's like, oh, light, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is both of their reaction. I think Matt and Elaine are equally horrified by the concept. Right. right. And I, and I do like also just the idea of, um, you know, the, the kin have been shocking the eyes to die with their numbers and their, uh, and, and about to, to with their age. Right. And so then they get this little shock of Birgitta being Elaine's uh, warder. Um, so kind of a, a nice sort of a uh, lots of um, new information coming about for all sides. I, I do agree that like, yes, Avianda from the chat, I do agree that like, yes, Avianda told her that she had to ask nicely, but like, or to be nice to Matt, but she, and by doing so is learning to like step back and be a little bit, not as much as she should be, but a little bit like, okay, he did do this thing. And I, if I remember right, like eventually she does actually stand up for him and be like, no, wait, Matt did help us. We should be more thankful. Yeah, she's also, I think, partially motivated by the fact that he's an Anderman. At one point, she's like, oh, he's my subject, so I should treat him with respect, which is like sideways, strange way to get to treating him like a human being. Yeah, it shouldn't be an afterthought, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll take what we can get. <laughs> like, it's, it's frustrating, for sure. And then, yeah, Matt's like, can you please make this uh, woman stop trying to attack me? Because she's he's, um, he like brought one of the maid kin up and she's trying to like stab him and stuff. And he's like, please make this stop. I don't like women with knives right now. This is making me uncomfortable. Please, please protect me. Yes. And she tries kicking him again. And then, <laughs> and then you, yeah, you have this like whole little scene going on of Matt trying to like get away from Derry's the maid uh, and Brigida like getting involved. And like, you can just imagine the physicality of that. Yeah, the physical comedy. <laughs> of them like running around and everything. While meanwhile, um, you know, they're asking Rianne her age. And then <laughs> she's like, yeah, I'm 412. The, yeah, the conversations with the physical humor and like Matt's like running away from Darius and then also looking at Elaine like you just you just thanked me what I'm so confused also ah run away. Also no I'm not your warder run away. <laughs> just need a, a little Benny Hill music. I know, yeah right exactly. And then, and then Morel faints which is the third woman to faint in this scene and I just so I personally have never like... fainted from surprise. No. no. Yeah, no it's also... really silly. Yeah, I, I really, it's such a trope and I really hate it. Like you don't see the men fainting from surprise. No. Um, and also like, pe yeah, people just be like, I, I get it that we've had mouths drop open and she wants to, and, he, and you know, and RJ wants to kind of maybe more emphasize just how shocking this is, but you actually could have just ended it on my next naming day will be my 412th. Like you that's didn't shocking. You know, that's shocking. We know that's shocking. You don't need to have Marilyn faint. I just, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's things like that that are peppered through the books where, I mean, RJ in many ways avoids the worst tropes of writing in the 80s and 90s. Um, but there's things like this that, you know, if it if the book were being edited now, it'd be like, just cut. yeah. Yeah. Fainting from fear, fainting from surprise. Like the only thing I've ever felt lightheaded from was rage. It's the only emotion that's ever made me feel lightheaded in the slightest. I think it would be better if they had like sat down and seemed faint or, you know, I've had things that have shocked me where I've sat down and just, you know, where I, where I was and been like, and then you don't, as your tunnel vision, your ears kind of go, Whoa, 
not like that makes more sense, but they're not, I mean, women fainting historically had a lot more to do with the corsets that they were wearing and the amount of clothes and the heat that they were in. And their wandering uteruses. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's yeah. not to say that women don't like that people people can't faint from shock it, it it can it's just it's such a trope in these books and in this particular chapter right that, like, fresh shock it's not necessary and it it is only used as a signal of weakness for female characters and that's where the concern comes from like they're not trying to say medically that people don't faint from shock. right right um i do i don't and Nicholas, uh, Nicholas had said in the chat that the same with the acid eye vomiting when talking about stilling that I get because that's like part of that. That's like part of who you are. Um, that would be like the possibility of you getting lobotomized being very common or uh, like something that could actually happen and someone discussing the possibility of like lobotomy to you like that would be very upsetting and you can get so emotionally upset that you like vomit yeah there's also vomiting from fear that happens this is being pointed out in chat which is like yeah i mean people respond in different ways but yeah it's like if the men fainted occasionally from fear or terror or or shock then then it wouldn't be annoying then it would be like oh people just are wearing too tight of waistcoats or whatever Mm -hmm. but the fact that it's only women is just just like if, if men had to be naked for their rituals Sure, right, exactly. Right, right. Then it would be fine. I'm fine with sky clad yeah. ritual. That makes all sense. We, right. But... <laughs> all we want is gender equality here, right? Like... Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, and also the um fainting. I have fainted before and fainted from blood loss. And it's uh it's not fun. Like, you know, they paint it in movies like it's really silly and it's terrifying. <laughs> like it's really terrifying. And I always thought, oh, that's so silly. But then it happened and I was like, it's really scary, and you start to like a babble really quickly and like your brain tries to like uh oh, this is happening this is happening and then you kind of like go out <laughs> and it's and it, you when you wake up it does not feel good like it it's like hurts and you have a headache and yeah it's it's definitely not like the silly like you no. know thing I've that- been I've been with someone when they fainted um and they just became a dead weight uh and would have hurt themselves very very badly if i had not been there it was just like boom um and it was yeah there was nothing kind of like oh about it it was it was very very i mean i I obviously wasn't the person fainting but it was incredibly scary to witness and to try to figure out how to help that person when they did you know regain consciousness to make sure they weren't injured and that they were coming back out because like you don't know what why it happened and is it going to happen again is there something is this a signal of something worse i mean that's like scary stuff and so just kind of using it as like a um a way to signal shock here i just think it's it's, it's a little bit of lazy writing on on, on rj's part yeah it, it did it definitely i think it takes away from the moment which is powerful Very enough so. on its own and you really don't need that element you know to sit down in shock in florida is is good enough or even the like quiet crying or it seems like some of them their eyes could have gone glazy and glassy and right or go stand next to the wall and like lean on it like Oh. Every single mouth dropped open this time, right? Because we've had a lot of mouths dropping open in shock, right? Uh, something like that. But I, yeah, you really just could have cut it at 412. And, and, and that is powerful because we all know, yeah, it's just unnecessary. And it's and- almost like it's inserted for comedy. And it's like, this is actually a very impressive moment. This doesn't need to be made funny. We just had physical comedy with Matt and Brigitte and Darius. Like this can be a moment of just impact. All in all, it's one of his his best chapters of the series. <laughs> Not none of that is to say we don't love RJ and his writing. There's just a few dated fingerprints that merit mentioning. <laughs> we all love this series. We've been, you know, praising a lot about the writing. Uh, we have to be able to be critical and critique art, um, which is what this is, uh, yeah. in order to properly enjoy it. You know, and you can't say that something's off the table. And like, so RJ's not perfect. RJ probably would have been the first to say he's not perfect. Harriet would have been the yeah. second, uh, or maybe reverse there. And uh, you know, and it doesn't mean we don't love this work or this scene or anything else. It's just pointing out things, different decisions that could have been made, um, and, and and thinking through, you know, what those what the implications are for people that are reading them. Yeah. And things that, you know, we can maybe look forward to there being in the show, like no fainting from emotion or gender equality in fainting from emotion. Like that could be a thing that gets updated. 
Gender equality and nudity would be oh God, lovely. Please. Everyone has hot butts, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you both so much for coming and doing this chapter. This was really, really fun to um, have your, your opinions on how amazing um, Mashiara is. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was really fun. Um, really appreciated all the comments in the chat too. Yeah, it's really nice to read through. It's it's actually only been two hours. It hasn't been three. Yeah, <laughs> coming in at under two hours is like, whoa. Yeah, it's a short chapter. Yeah, it's dense, but it's short. And yeah, this has just been an absolute blast. Yeah, you, you both had so many fun things to say about it. That like I, for some reason, I've never really gotten a lot of the romance out of this series. I've always been like, well, that was abrupt, except for Nynaeve and Lamp. But even then, it's like I was apparently reading very, very different takes on romance as a kid. So it was fun to get perspectives from people who get so much of the romance out of this. I started reading this series that I mentioned, you know, in, in the mid nineties. So when I was reading it, book six had just come out. And so, and this is 25 years later. So I have grown up with this series. And so my responses to it have changed over time as well, which I think is one of the amazing things about the series, uh, particularly for those of us that read it as it was coming, or at least some of it as it was coming out, and you got to like enjoy the kind of speculation and theorizing about it. But one of the reasons I really wanted to do this chapter is because the last chapter that I had done was about a relationship that I loved when I was 14, um, or I guess I was, you know, 15, 16, whatever, teenager, uh, and now detest. And I wanted to talk about this other relationship that I loved from the beginning and still love. Um, despite some of the, you know, whatever flaws we talked about in the writing, like it's just such an amazing relationship. And I think that this, you know, chapter just really is some of the best of what, what the series is all about. I mean, it's such just a great representation of, of character and plot um, and why, you know, we all love the series. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I started it when I was 15 and finished it about 22-ish. I started in 2005. And so I really, I really connected with Egwene because it was like her age and then all the way like her age to, to the end. Going back and reading it again, there was a lot of things. I was like, oh, I love this character. Like I really liked Matt first time around. And every time I've, I've gone and reread it, I like him less and less. And it, I think it has a lot to do with just like who I am now as a person. And I don't connect very well with people that feel like forced to have to help their friends or like um, to be in the, the way that like the womanizing in it is like got more and more on my nerves, but also like being able to go back and see that, you know, things like the pink ribbons was wrong. You know, it's just cha a change in the culture itself and the culture like I grew up in and the way the culture is now and and what uh, is acceptable and not acceptable. And, you know, to be able to look back and I've read more books now and I've watched more movies, look back and be like, oh, this is a very, you know, 1980s, you know, thing where they're really toxic. It's very like moonlighting, you know, they're mean to each other and uh, it's not good to be like that. Um, but it's nice to be able to, yeah, like you were saying, like have that and still be like, you know, this core relationship or this core plot line is still so relevant and it's even more relatable as I get older. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And even though, even though the books themselves, you know, are the same, our responses to them do change as we get older. I find I'm a lot more interested in the you know, quote unquote adult characters than I was. Um, as a teenager, you know, as a teenager, you know, you're really into the Evans Fielders because they're your age and they're, they seem like the protagonists, but I'm much more interested in a lot of the, um, you know, like a, a Maureen and a Swan and a Gareth Brynn uh, now uh, th than I was then. Um, and I also, you know, it is interesting. And I think one of the things that I love and will always love about the Wheel of Time is that while my responses to characters and scenes change, you know, Pink Ribbons is a great example of that. This series always gives me something to think about and I enjoy reading it 
Whereas there's other series that I read at the same time that I have gone back to read and found, um, I don't want to read this anymore. Um, and I, I don't, the example I will give is the, the Sword of Shannara, which is Terry Brooks. It was one of the first fantasy books that I read. And I, re I have very strong memories of reading it and loving it. And maybe a couple of years ago, I picked it up again. I'm like, I'm going to read Shannara. I know there's like a lot of other books that have come out. Like, I'm going to reread that. I haven't touched it since the, you know, 90s or something. I'm going to reread it. Do you know that there is uh, not one named female character in the Sword of Shannara? The closest you get is a minor character mentions their fiance. I don't know that she gets a name. And I was, I, I made it like three quarters of the way through the book. And I'm not the kind of person that so like just stops reading a book in the middle. And I was like, you know something? No, I'm not giving this any more of my time. I don't want to read another book that is entirely male characters. It doesn't have to be. And Lord of the Rings, you're on that list too, by the way, as much as I still love the films and that, you know, there's great things about Lord of the Rings. I'm like, I don't want to reread that book. At least there's Arwen and, you know, an Awen, but you know, there are good female characters in there, but Sora Jannara didn't even have that. And, you know, the Wheel of Time, despite these kinds of things that we're talking about, some very problematic issues in relationships and treatments of gender in this series, it still has some of the most powerful, most interesting female characters in, in fantasy fiction ever. And, um, and I, that is something I needed as a teenager um, and yeah. still need as an adult. I think it's almost, it's almost completely female driven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I found these books also when I was a teenager in the early 2000s. And I have learned so much about myself and about the world from rereading them over and over again. The fact that the books don't change as I grow and change, like my ideas about gender, my ideas about power, my, my basic knowledge of what military strategy is. I mean, these things have all grown from my love of Wheel of Time and the fact that it is so complete. And there are so many characters that do so many different things. And like, now I have two tattoos for it. And like, you know, it's just, having it with me as I've grown and through my whole life and as I read other books and then compare it to Wheel of Time like that has been just such a profound like piece of my life at this point like that's why I got my first big tattoo was I was like at this point my life has been thoroughly shaped by these books like even if I never read them again like too much of how I passed through the latter half of my adolescence is shaped by marinating <laughs> in RJ's writing and it's you know, I'm so grateful that like the boy I had a crush on was like, you like big books. Maybe you'd like this. And I'm like, yes, yes, I do. Also, I like you, but I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> well, and it, it's not just that. I mean, it speaks to the story, the community that has come from it and the community that is built on it. And, you know, we'll, we'll see whatever happens with the show. I don't have high hopes, but um, it, the series itself has created this kind of community. And, you know, for me, my life has been completely changed um, because of because of the wheel of time, every person I am close to is I've met through the fandom. And, you know, my, I met my partner uh, because of the fandom. I'm living in Minnesota because, <laughs> because I uh, ended up liking the wheel of time at 15 years old, you know, living outside DC and, you know, getting into a series that introduced me to people that gave me a, uh, an opportunity to work on the series. And then from there, you know, go to a convention where I met people that had friend that, you know, now I live with. <laughs> so it's just, uh, it's pretty wild. And it, it really speaks to the quality of the, the characters and the type of person that RJ was. And, you know, yeah, there were, there were flaws. And I, you know, I, a lot of us do wish that he were around still to like give us his opinions on all of this. Yeah. yeah. The, the great loss that we, I mean. At least we found each other. We yeah. Did. And Collectively, I also... we're almost one RJ. <laughs> <laughs> and I also met my spouse, not only through the Wheel of Time, but through this podcast um, and the Discord community. So definitely um, one of the most yeah. nifty accomplishments of the podcast, Amazing. Yes. bringing together such yeah. awesome people into such a <laughs> profound connection. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that that's such a crucial point, Ariel, is that it's it's these books, it's our responses to these books as we, as we age, but, and this community that has built up around this series uh, and, and how we're able to find so many things to, to spend hours talking about a single chapter um, of this series and uh, with my, much more content to come is, uh, is pretty tremendous. It's pretty great. Yeah, um, and, and briefly on just uh, on RJ and Harriet, a, a funny story is that uh, 
one of the times that I was at a meeting in her in her house and um, my partner was there, we were going through like new shirts with Tavern and Tees and um, he was like test modeling out to them because he's, he's a good looking guy. He's very tall, he's triangular built, he's long, dark hair and everything. And Harriet just kept, oh, you so remind me so much of my James. And she kept saying like how he was, he just reminded her so much of, of uh, Robert Torton and uh, how he was so handsome and tall. And I was like, oh gosh, Harriet, like get a room. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, um, it was really, really sweet as one of my uh, like cherished memories. She was, she was being really funny with him. Um, but yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. It, it's an incredible series and I'm, I'm so grateful for it. And, you know, no matter what the show ends up being, we have, we have these books and we have this community and I don't think that's going to go away. Absolutely. No. I mean, like, whatever the show does we will bond over how we feel about it like oh, yeah that will be part of the experience yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. we will have opinions oh kitty kitty chirps Sorry. <laughs> never <laughs> apologize for cats on zoom <laughs> i'm done i'm done with this um, <laughs> um and she's actually been she's been there through most of most of me working on the series too she's as old as my contracts um, Aww. <laughs> contract kitty on Aww. sets dragging up timber <laughs> I think I'm the only one without a fur baby running around in this. I need to fix that. fix that. I need to fix that. We're coming up on a year of being here at this place where there's room in in space and headspace. So fur babies are not too far away. Yeah, there's <laughs> lots lots of fur babies that need love and homes. Oh. Yes, very much she's, so. She's a rescue. Thank you. Yeah, this has been wonderful. Thanks again so much. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?